Before today's video, I'd like to invite you to An Evening with Constantine Kissin. He's the author of An Immigrant's Love Letter to the West and the co-host of the hugely popular Trigonometry podcast. He'll be touring Australia in February and March, giving a fresh perspective that's both enlightening and engaging. To book your tickets, head to our website, cis.org.au, or click the link in the description. I'll see you there. The Iraqis, the Afghanis, they don't want the Americans intervening in their political and social life and telling them what kind of political system they should have, what their social system should look like, and so forth and so on. But that's what the United States is into. I'm Rob Forsyth, and this is Liberalism in Question. One man who does question liberalism is my guest, John Mishimer. John is uh, the H. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, Chicago where he's taught since 1982. He tells me he's graduated from West Point and even served in the American military for 10 years during the Vietnam era. He's written many books. The one that I most like was the one, The Great Delusion, Liberal Dreams, International, Re International Realities. John, welcome. My pleasure to be here. You're not against liberalism. No, I love liberalism as a political ideology for a particular state. So in terms of domestic politics, I think I'm very fortunate to have been born and raised in a liberal democracy like the United States. But I think liberalism as a foreign policy is a prescription for really big trouble, if not disaster. So I discriminate between liberalism as a political system on the home front versus liberalism as a foreign policy. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's unpack that. What, what, what is liberalism in your mind, simply defined? Liberalism is based on two assumptions. One is that the individual matters more than the society in which he or she lives. So liberalism is all about individualism. That's point number one. And point number two is the belief that people cannot agree about first principles. To put that in slightly different terms, it's the belief that people cannot agree on what is the best life. And sometimes those disagreements are so profound that they'll kill each other, these individuals, okay? The liberal solution to this problem is, number one, to emphasize rights and the idea that everybody has the right to live life the way they see fit. So even though you and I may have different views on what is the best religion, we can be members of that religion that we think is the correct one. If you want to be a Protestant and I want to be a Catholic, fine, right? So that's point number one. There are rights. Yes. Point number two is you preach the norm of tolerance. And you preach the norm of tolerance in a liberal society because, again, people don't agree on first principles. Then the third basic element of the liberal solution to these problems that I described is that you need a state. And you need a state just in case the norm of tolerance doesn't work. In other words, if you don't tolerate yeah. me and you decide you're going to kill me, I have to be able to appeal to the state. But very importantly, that state cannot be too powerful because once you get a really powerful state in the liberal story, that, state's be that state begins to infringe on your right or my right to live life the way we want. So you have this separation between civil society and the state, where in civil society, you and I have certain rights that allow us to live the good life the way we see fit. It's a, I think Francis Fukuyama said, it's a solution to the problem of pluralism. Because there is pluralism, to, to, instead of the liberal state deciding the big questions of life, it leaves that to individuals and, and communities it sets the framework in which they can live That's together. absolutely right. It, yeah. it's, liberalism is based on the assumption that there is no truth. You have a particular version of what is the truth. It's the truth from your point of view. I have a particular version of what is the truth from my point of view. And what happens in a liberal society is you're allowed to... But you could be a member of a liberal society and believe there is a truth. It's just that it's not the job of the state to tell you what it is. Well... I can believe there's a truth, yes. but I have to understand in a liberal society that there are other people oh, yes. who disagree. Yes, that's true. I mean, this is the fundamental problem. As I said in the beginning, 
Liberalism is based on two assumptions. One, the focus is on the individual, not the society that he or she lives in. Number two, people cannot agree on first principles. To put it in the rhetoric that we're using now, we're saying people cannot agree on what is the truth. And once okay. that happens, right, if you get a case where people disagree in fundamental ways, this is Catholics versus Protestants in the days of Hobbes versus Locke. Yeah. Right. People were willing to kill each other. So you had these religious wars. Although I guess you could at least believe in individualism and tolerance and rights. You must have that, that in common to be under society. Yeah. Must have some truths that you believe in. Yeah. Well, you, I mean, the whole subject of rights is very complicated because yes. when yeah. you talk about rights in a liberal society, you're talking about inalienable rights. Right. These are rights that apply universally. And in a very important way, you're kind of beginning to talk about truths. You're yes, saying you are. everybody You're has making actually rights. metaphysical claims, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed you distinguish two kinds of liberalism progressive and what you call modus vivendi liberalism. What's yeah. the difference between the two? Well, modus vivendi liberalism is. What does that mean, by the way? Uh, to Latin for. Yeah, just to let people. Let, live. let, let it be. Yeah. 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 It, it, modus vivendi liberalism in my story is associated with a limited state. Yes. And all it does, this limited state, is make sure that people don't kill each other and that. Uh, a, a very libertarian view of. Uh, a very libertarian yeah. view, yeah. And what's happened over time is that uh, we've developed a, a much more powerful state uh, yep. in liberal societies, and that state is interested in making sure that people have, for example, equal rights, and it will do all sorts of things to interfere in the affairs of individuals uh, that begin to sort of tread on liberal principles. It's a very fine line there. And that's often, we at the CIS are often discussing whereabouts we think the state should or shouldn't be in, this, in these matters. It's a matter of dispute within in liberal societies when the state should intervene to overcome Inequality, or let people have the freedom to fl to flourish by themselves. Right. That yeah. that is the big question. The big question. Right. And the problem that you really face here is that starting in the late nineteenth century, uh, with industrialization yes. uh, and the rise of nationalism, you you reached a point where people wanted the state to do all sorts of things to make life better for great numbers of people in the society. And the state grew in size, and the state began to interfere more and more uh, in the life of the average individual. So it's no longer modus vivendi liberalism. You have a state that has a progressive agenda. You have a point of view which is best, or, or just observing. You're describing this, but you, you personally think, is the state good at helping people become more equal, or is it unhelpful and it should be left to more comp natural competition in markets? You come down on any. I don't think there's a simple answer. To no, that. I no. mean, I, I think you. That's need, why I asked the question. Yeah, no, <laughs> no. I think you need a state. Yes, yes. And I think in the modern world, that state has to be quite powerful. But at the same time, from a liberal point of view, it's very important that that state not be too powerful. You want to put limits on it. This is one of the principal reasons I'm against fighting wars all over the planet. Because once you start fighting wars all over the planet, you create a very powerful state. You create a national security state. And in the United States, for example, we have a system of checks and balances where the, the legislative branch of um, our government is supposed to be responsible for declaring war. But that has gone by the boards. And the president in the United States today can start a war anytime. And, and, and often does. And often it does, exactly. <laughs> I want to come to your foreign affairs just a moment, just one other matter. You, you make the point that, that any political philosophy has a view of human nature. You, 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 there's a commitment to what, what are humans like. That's correct. And liberalism has one, and you think it's got some deficiencies. Well, I think the two assumptions are very interesting and very important. One of them is right on the money, and the other one, I think, is in a very important way flawed. Right. The one that is correct is that people cannot agree on first principles. They cannot agree on what is truth or what is the good life. And it's just very important to understand that. Um, but with regard to the focus on the individual over the society, I believe that we are all social human beings. 
right? We, we, we're born into and we live in societies. And what we do is we carve out space for our individualism. We're not born individuals. We become individuals through our families and context. That's correct. That's so correct. The, the myth, the liberal myth of the solitary people who then join together in a social contract is that just that. Yes, exactly. Exactly. But I, I want to be clear. I do understand the importance of individualism. Oh, yes, I no. love the fact that, you know, in a country like the United States, I'm free to say and do all sorts of things. So, so liberalism under, so, sorry, John, liberalism underplays the social nature of human human. Beings. Absolutely. This is why my argument in The Great Delusion, this book that I wrote, is that nationalism is absolutely essential to make liberalism work. Because when you have an ideology like liberalism that focuses exclusively on the individual, the question, and those individuals can't agree on first principles, the question is what's the glue that holds them all together? In a liberal society without nationalism, you have very powerful centrifugal forces at play because, again, people cannot agree on first principles. So what holds? what's the glue that holds it all together? And my argument is that nationalism is one form of glue, a very important form of glue. So my argument is you and I live in liberal nation states. Yeah. We don't live in just a liberal political entity. We live in a liberal nation state, and that now, what's a nation na state embellishes what nationalism is all what's about. A what's a nation, John, from your point of view? A nation is a large group of people who have a very powerful sense that they have certain things in common that bands them together. Right. Australians have a certain sense of what it means to be an Australian and how being an Australian is different than being... Chinese or being even an American or a Brit, right? You have this Especially culture. during the cricket. You want to see us then. Exactly. <laughs> no, that's a really good example. Yes, the ashes bring it out very quickly for us. Yes, yes. Sport. Almost everybody agrees at this point in time that sports is where nationalism manifests it's itself altering. in profound ways. So again, my argument is that we are social beings from the get-go and we carve out space for our individualism. And to use your rhetoric, we're not individuals who form social contracts. Is, is, we're, we're, we're trying in this country, and I think we're doing fairly well, at being a, quote, multicultural nation. Is that, is, is that, is that a possible? Can you be a multicultural nation? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it all depends on how you define the nation. Look at the United States. The United States was basically, at the start, pretty much an Anglo-Saxon Protestant country. Then starting in around 1830, 1835, huge numbers of immigrants began to come into the United States. Germans, Irish, Jews, Poles, and Italians. Those were the big five groups. And then since 1965, when we uh, reopened the gates, which had been closed in 1924, we've gotten huge numbers of Hispanics and huge numbers mm -hmm. of, uh, of Asians. So you have this multicultural society almost from the beginning. And American identity might have been a, ha, might have been uh, identified with being a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant in the beginning, but you know by 1900, certainly by 1945 when World War II ends, so, but that's for, gone by the board. But for the nation to be a nation, there must be a, must be a sense of us, the, the phrase, the imagined community. It's an yes, that, that's that's. The phrase, yes. Benedict Anderson's yes, right, famous yes. term, which really captures it. It's an imagined community. So I can have somebody who's black and American, right, or Puerto Rican or some form of Hispanic or Filipino or Chinese who's an American, and I have no problem with that whatsoever because American identity is not identified for the vast majority of color with the color of your skin I don't, or your religion. I won't go down this too far, but some countries I notice have maybe two racial groups, a minority and a majority, and they often they struggle for nationalism because the majority are identified with the nation. Minority find themselves in a difficult situation. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, that, that, that can be very serious for oh, national unity. No, absolutely no question about that. The United States uh, is uh, an exception in this yes. regard. And as you remember, people used to talk when I was young about white Australia, correct? Yes, indeed. And that world is... Thankfully, in my opinion, gone by the board. It's probably helped too by the fact that both our nations are islands. I know you're not really an island, but you've got sea either side, the Canadians in the north. There's a way in which you're not like a, a country in Europe which is constantly changing borders and 
and interacting with populations. That's a yeah. much more difficult area to get nationhood in. Yeah. Well, if you think of Eastern Europe, you know, you go back yeah. to Eastern Europe, let's say 1918, World War I ends, and you look at what Eastern Europe looks like. You have all these different groups that are mixed up. Now, one of your key points is that when it comes to a wrestle, nationalism beats liberalism every time. Correct. Because we're social beings. First and foremost. First and foremost. Okay. So if it, and there are good evidence of these. Can you give me an example of where nationalism has utterly, utterly beat individualism, liberalism? Well, I think that the fact is that um, uh, if you look at uh, a society where there are uh, two groups, one is the dominant group yes. that identifies the nation. The nation is identified with nationalism and that country is largely identified with. And you have a minority group uh, that is not accepted and is seen as a threat to the majority group. And that majority group tries to crush the minority group. And this is initially a liberal society. This is a case of nationalism trumping yeah. liberalism. And there have been some cases, some sad cases in Europe and in Asia where that's happened. Yeah, it's true in the United States as well. I mean, if you think about, you know, if you think about how, I mean, put slavery aside, which is really the best example. Yes, you think about how whites treated blacks. If you look at the history of immigration into the United States, uh, what happened to those five ethnic groups that came in uh, starting in the 1830s, especially the Irish, uh, the Irish who immigrated from Europe to the United States were treated uh, like dirt. Right. It is really horrible. There's a book in, uh, published in the United States a couple decades ago now. It's called When the Irish Became White. Just think about the title. It's a great book. title. It says when, it all. When it says it all. It says it all. It says it, it says all. It all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, it is important to understand that there is, and the United States is widely seen as a liberal society, a liberal democracy since you know seven. But nationalism is there. Nationalism is there. Well, I'll give you the best example of that. Think of Madeleine Albright's famous saying. We are the indispensable nation. Do you understand that word, nation? Nation? Yes, 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 yes. We are the indispensable nation. The word indispensable. Think of the chauvinism that underpins that. We're telling you, 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 you Australians, we, we Americans are the indispensable no, no, no. nation. We are the most successful multicultural nation on earth, John. You should know that. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. That's what you get. That's that sense of exceptionalism. Yes. Right, that, that is at the heart of, of nationalism. And as you were pointing out, this oftentimes causes trouble when you have mixed ethnic groups or mixed groups. Or, or nations, nations. trying to try to get separate from other nations at the, the wars when Yugoslavia collapsed. Absolutely, yep. Good, Czechoslovakia, yes, the yep. Soviet Union, and Yugoslavia after World War II. Now, let's, after the Cold War. let's now go to, can we take this from the inside of nation state and transpose it to the, quote, rules-based rules -based international order. Can we have liberalism on a global scale, John? Well, the problem that you face is that there is a crusader impulse built into liberalism. And the crusader impulse revolves around rights. Liberals are obsessed with rights, individual rights. Individual rights are a wonderful thing most of the time. But once you talk about inalienable rights, that means everybody on the planet has the same rights. And therefore, there's a powerful incentive to run around the planet and protect the rights of other individuals, individuals who live outside your country's borders. So what you get with the United States during the unipolar moment, this is after the Cold War ends in 1989, for the next, let's say, 20 plus years, right? What the United States is doing is running around the planet trying to do social engineering on a massive scale because it wants to turn every country in the world into a liberal democracy. And it wants to make sure that all those people who live in those countries 
have this certain. Now you're thinking. You're right. thinking. You think of the Middle East. You're thinking of. Yeah, I mean, this is what the Bush Doctrine was all about. The Bush Doctrine, which was enunciated before we went into Iraq in March of 2000. Before, before 9 11. Well, we, we were talking about it even before 9 11, but after 9 11 yeah. is when the Bush Doctrine was enunciated, right? But there's no question, it was there. I'll tell you where it starts. It starts with Francis Fukuyama's famous Primus, article. Primus, yes, I, yes. Right, the, the end of history. Just think the about, last man in the end of history. Yeah, yes. just think about what Fukuyama's argument is, that now that the Cold War is over with, and we defeated fascism in the first half of the 20th century, and we defeated communism in the second half of the 20th century, what's going to happen what's now? Left? Liberal democracy yes. everywhere. So Frank's argument is that we have the wind at our back. Right, that liberal democracy is going to spread across the planet because it is the best political system, and everybody realizes that. Once you begin to think like that, then you begin to think that you can intervene here, there, and everywhere. Well, how did how did that go? How did how did that all work out? It worked out very badly. <laughs> think, think Afghanistan. Think the Iraq War. Think about Libya. Think about Syria. Think about all the places that we intervened with, you know, noble intentions. My good friend Steve Walt wrote a book called The Hell of Good Intentions because he basically... Now, why? why? What, it, surely they, those people want to be free because it ran into nationalism. Oh, I see. That's the key. You know, this gets back to your earlier question where liberalism and nationalism clash. Nationalism is all about self-determination. If you're Australian, you don't want the Americans coming in and telling you how to run your political Not system. anymore. We're sick of it, John. We're sick yes. of it. <laughs> but that's true of everybody. The Iraqis, the Afghanis, they don't want the Americans intervening in their political and social life and telling them what kind of political system they should have, what their social system should look like, and so forth and so on. But that's what the United States is into. The United States thinks that, Frank. Fukuyama has got it right, that we've got the wind at our back, number one. Number two, we're incredibly powerful, right? And that we have a responsibility, both a moral and strategic responsibility, to intervene in these countries to make them look like us. Because the idea is if you can make the whole planet look like Australia, the United States, Britain, New Zealand, so forth and so on, we're all going to live happily ever after. And add to that too, I hope you're not offended by this, but Americans often are not sensitive to other cultures. I mean, that's a truism. <laughs> of course. Amer Americans are almost completely insensitive to right. other cultures. That's going to work out. Does that even apply to the UN producing these, uh, <clears throat> intervening about the rights of women, the rights of children? You know, there's a whole international movement out there. Does that also fall under your criticism of international liberalism? Of course. Rights of women. What if you have a country like Afghanistan that's run by people who think that women are basically second-class citizens? What do you do about that? My basic view is I reject that view, right? I want to see women treated the same as men. But if the people in Afghanistan want... So you live, just let them be. You're not going to go in there and rescue them. That's correct. But I am an anomaly in the United States. I going to say you're very unusual. <laughs> Most American foreign policy... Uh, experts and, and policymakers want to go into places like Afghanistan uh, and do social engineering. Or, or in, and if we don't go in with military force, they want to intervene in all sorts of other ways. They want to use NGOs. They want to use the United Nations. Uh, they want to use American funding uh, to socially engineer countries like Afghanistan so that women have equal rights. Again, now, I think it's a noble intention Right. But the problem is that you have countries around the world that don't want to look like. So the your argument, States. your argument, John, is not that it's not a good idea. The argument it simply won't work, and that's why it's not a good idea. It simply can't be done. Well, again, it also gets back to my starting assumption in describing liberalism that people disagree about what the truth is. All right. Let me just give you an example: fascism. In the 1930s in Germany, the overwhelming majority of Germans really liked fascism. They were not unhappy with fascism. Evidently so. Right. Given a choice between liberalism and fascism, they would take fascism. 
which, which they did, in effect, they did. Which, in effect, they did. Right. With the help of uh, the Nazi machine. Right. Well, Hit Hitler was venerated. Hit yes, Hitler yes. was the only leader of a Western country, I shouldn't, was the only leader of an industrialized country who pulled this country out of the Depression. Very important to understand that he's the only leader who pulled this country out of the Depression in the 30s. That is so depressing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Matt, I, I'm, I'm not defending... No, no, you're not. No, but I'm, I'm just saying that... You, you're trying to tell the truth. But the question then becomes, how do you think about a country that likes fascism? Do, do, do you say, I'm going to go in there and change the system? I'm going to overthrow the government? Look, look, that's a good example. What if... You knew about the Holocaust. You knew about the wholesale genocide of a people. Would that justify intervention? I mean, that's a, that's a very hard case, but that's the thing. No, that. Well, first of all, a lot depends on whether you think you can go in and prevent genocide on a uh, you know for, at, at some reasonable price. I mean, take Rwanda. I was thinking about right? it too. Yeah, uh, we were very hesitant to go into Rwanda at first, even though. That was an easy case for intervention, right? The costs would have been very low. I was in favor of going into Rwanda like that. Uh, I think it was back in 1994, yeah. 1993. I can't remember which year. Uh, but going into Germany, you know, let's assume that you're correct. That in 1939, we understood that... Yeah, we, which we didn't. I don't, I don't remember. We did not, of that. course. We did not understand the Holocaust was coming. But let's assume that we had. Would we have gone in? I think the answer is we definitely would not have gone in. Uh, wow. And uh, I think that it's, this is because of nationalism. It's very unusual for one group of people to be willing to pay a significant, if not huge, blood price to rescue another people. And this is why the Jews are so enamored with Israel. We have our own state. Yes. We have our own state where we can protect ourselves, Right. And if you look at the Palestinians today, why do the Palestinians want a state? Because the Palestinians understand what happens when you don't have your own state. And by the way, the concept of a nation state, nation state, that's nationalism. We're talking about the Palestinians that's having nationalism. a state, We're talking about the Jews having a state. What was the name of Theodore Herzl's book, his famous book, right? He is the Zionist, or, the famous Zionist thing. He's the father of Zion. Yes. Theodore yes. Herzl. His book is called the Jewish state. Just think about those words. Nation, state, yeah. Jewish state. Jewish is for nation. State. Jewish is for nation, state. Exactly. There's a Jewish nation, Jewish tribe, give them their own state. Palestinians want their own state. The Kurds want their own state. And the reason that this is the power of nationalism, it's inextricably bound up with survival. If you have a nation, that nation needs a state. And it needs a state because that's the best way for that nation to protect itself. And again, think the Jews, think the Palestinians, think the Can, Kurds. Can't there be benign empires to have many nations under, under a overarching protection? Well, first of all, you could have a multinational country. Yes. Right? But empires are no more, right? You, you can't have an empire. Uh, I mean, like the British Empire, where India was under the British Empire, Kenya was under the British Empire. Those days are long gone. Oh, I'm not saying you have it now. I'm thinking theoretically. Although, interesting, the British Empire was was sufficiently successful because it did not try and impose a great deal. It did to try and impose some. Um, but you want the to burning ask yourself, of Why did the British Empire disintegrate? Because the people did not want to be told by the British what to do. Nationalism. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the top is why. Right. Nationalism. Even we didn't want them to do what to do. I'm shocked to hear that. <laughs> and did you know the same thing is true of the United States? Yes, well, <laughs> you broke away. You broke away. Yeah, Canada. I mean, so John, th is... that's 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 the point, though. You see the power of nationalism. But I want to be clear here. I think liberalism and nationalism can coexist, right? I talked to Victor within Orban. within a state within a state. Yeah, I talked to Victor Orban, who is the leader in. Uh, Hungry. Hungry. I had a three-hour conversation with him, and we talked at some length about this. He hates liberalism, and he likes nationalism. And his argument is that Hungary is an illiberal democracy. He believes it's a democracy, yep. but he really, he really relishes nationalism. And he thinks nationalism and liberalism can't coexist. 
I think there's serious tensions, for sure, between liberalism and nationalism, but I think they can coexist. And as I said to you before, I think nationalism provides the glue that keeps a liberal state together, number one. And number two, liberalism tempers some of so, nationalism's dark sides. So if we're not going to go around the world to make the world a better place by our armies and, and um, NGOs, what should we be doing in the world? Be a good example. Be a good example. Be the city on the hill. Concentrate on getting... Very American thing to say. <laughs> get, getting things right at home. Okay. And you can go around the world and tell people that you think that liberal democracy is the best political system and point out the virtues uh, and so forth and so on. And, but otherwise, I would stay out of the domestic politics of other countries, even if I disagreed in fundamental ways with the way they ran their country. With the one exception, genocide. There, uh, I, I would be uh, willing, in most cases, to go in and put an end to it. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, by my, you know, to talk about the Holocaust, by my count, the Germans murdered 5.7 million Jews. My argument is overall they murdered 22 million people. Yes. Right. Yes, I'm well aware of that. And this was a killing machine that murdered huge numbers of people, right? The Jews were certainly the number one targeted group. They, they, were, were, they weren't the only group. I know, they true. were not the only no. people. Right, There's, you read about the hunger plan, uh, yes. as General Plan East. Oh my God, what those Germans were up to uh, in the late '30s and in World War II. Uh, but, but anyway, with regard to genocide, uh, you do. I, I'd be willing to, uh, in most cases, go in. So you are a liberal, but who questions it? You're a liberal in question. <laughs> no, I, I'm a liberal on At the whole front. front. Yes. No, I, I'm, I'm committed to liberalism, but not. But a liberal foreign policy, I do not like. I, I'm a realist when it comes to foreign policy. Yeah, you are. And a lot of it has to do with nationalism. You know, if you look at my book, The Great Delusion, I say in the very beginning that one of my motives for writing the book was to think about the relationship between liberalism, nationalism, and realism. Okay? Yep. So what I've said to you today is that on the home front, I care about liberalism and nationalism and how they interact with each other. And I think they can coexist and they can help each other thrive. And then I said, with regard to foreign policy, where I think about liberalism versus realism, I like realism because liberalism runs into nationalism when you pursue... And realism is thinking about your own, your own nation's rights and powers. Yeah, yeah. It focuses on your country, the survival of your country. Yes. And you, there's no social engineering in the realist story. John Michel, I thank you very much. It was my pleasure. It's been great to talk to you. That was yet another in the Liberalism in Question series. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for watching.